Thanks, Tim, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today to introduce what I think is a, a really exciting uh, biotech company and a genuine ca candidate for a, for a hidden gem, as, as is our focus today. Um, I've been working in the biotech industry for over 20 years, building businesses with breakthrough technologies, breakthrough products, and entering new markets. And so when I had the opportunity to join Adalta 18 months ago, I was thrilled with a company that uh, at the time was focused on a single product, but it had this enormous potential to generate many, many uh, different and breakthrough drugs based on our unique eye body technology. So that's our purpose in life is to generate a portfolio of eye body enabled drugs against debilitating diseases that have challenged our traditional approaches to uh, drug therapeutics. Um, the next slide provides an example of a disease that illustrates why we need these new approaches to drug discovery. A uh, disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a degenerative, debilitating lung disease, results in progressive decline of respiratory function or lung function, increasing difficulties of breathing. We don't know what causes it, but half of patients will die after less than four years after diagnosis. This is a $3 billion drug market today, but the two drugs on the market actually don't work particularly well. They slow the decline of fibrosis. They slow the decline of respiratory function, but they don't extend life. And they come with some very severe side effects such that most patients can't tolerate these drugs uh, for more than about a year. Um, even worse, as we know with the uh, effect of COVID on, on lung uh, disease and lung function, there's a high likelihood that the burden of fibrotic lung disease is going to increase in the coming years as a result of patients surviving severe COVID. Now, what's the challenge with IPF? Um, there are many diseases where we don't understand the underlying biology, but there are others like IPF where we know that there are plenty of interesting targets for new therapeutics, but we don't know how to address them. And this is the case with uh, IPF. There's a target called CXCR4 that we've been able to identify uh, and design eye bodies against that have proved very challenging for traditional antibodies. So it's a great example of what we call our eye body advantage. So on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the company as a whole. What do we have today? Well, we have this asset creation engine called our eye body platform. And essentially this is a library of 20 billion variants of our, our little eye body uh, scaffolds uh, that can be directed against any target of interest. We've already discovered two assets from this pipeline, uh, from this platform. AD214 is our lead asset. It's being targeted at fibrotic diseases such as IPF that we just spoke about. It's currently a clinical stage asset. It is in phase one clinical trials at the moment, um, addressing initially the $3 billion market for IPF, but with potential in a range of other fibrotic indications, each of which is worth more than a billion dollars today. Our second asset um, is, a, a is addressing a target called Granzyme B. We'll talk more about this later on. Uh, but this is being developed in collaboration with multinational company GE Healthcare. In fact, it's fully funded by GE Healthcare. They brought us the target targeting problem and asked us to generate eye bodies against Granzyme B so that they could develop um, PET imaging agents for identifying those patients responding to the amazing new checkpoint inhibitor drugs. Uh, the PET imaging market is a $6.4 billion market. This is a drug essentially in our pipeline for free. It is already generating revenue for us uh, and will continue to do so uh, even before it comes to market. So off that rich, already rich asset pipeline, uh, we have a number of catalysts that help us accelerate our growth into the future. We do, we're not resting on our laurels. This is not just about these two assets. We're planning to significantly expand this product pipeline over the next two to three years, such that by the end of 2023, we aim to have 10 products in our pipeline. Um, we'll add the next two to three of those in the course of the next six to nine months. Uh, in terms of AD214, we've got further phase one clinical data emerging through the course of the remainder of this year. Uh, and once we achieve that data, that will set us up to initiate phase two studies potentially against a range of indications. It also opens up a first partnering window uh, where we may be able to partner with large pharmaceutical companies to further progress the asset, uh, generating milestones and ultimately future royalties. We've also got milestones coming for the Granzyme B asset with GE Healthcare, um, 
towards the end of this year, we, we are hoping to achieve preclinical proof of concept. Uh, we're hoping to add a second collaboration with another company uh, in the middle of this year and add two more targets to our internal pipeline um, by the end of the year as well. So let's talk about iBodies themselves and why are they unique on the next slide. Um, drugs work by engaging what we call a target, a biological target. There's some uh, receptor in, in our bodies uh, that is not working properly. It needs to be kickstarted or it needs to be shut down. Traditionally, we've used small molecules for this as shown on the top left image uh, or cartoon on this page. Uh, these are able to hit many of these targets, but they're not particularly selective and therefore have a lot of off target or side effects. Monoclonal antibodies or antibody therapeutics revolutionized drug discovery 30 years ago. Uh, they've transformed many diseases because they're way more specific, but they're very large molecules you can see with a central cartoon here, and they can't get into all of these nooks and crevices that the small molecules can. So again, there are limitations to what they can do. I-bodies on the right-hand side are a small format what's called a single domain antibody. They're about a 10th of the size of a traditional antibody. And they have really long and flexible uh, binding areas that can get into these uh, difficult um, and deep membrane crevices with the same degree of specificity of an antibody, but with the penetration capability of a small molecule. And importantly, we can use these in a whole range of different formats. Uh, they can be a therapeutic in their own right, or we can use them as a, as a GPS tracker, if you like, to deliver a payload or a cargo of, of therapeutic material uh, with a high degree of specificity. Um, so it's this broad capability that gives us the opportunity to create many, many different drugs. If I turn to our lead product, AD214 now, and focus on what it is about fibrotic disease uh, on the next slide, thank you. So the top picture shows what happens when a, a human organ uh, uh, is inflicted by fibrosis. Top image on the left shows a normal human lung, lots of open airway space for gas exchange between the lungs and the bloodstream. In fibrosis, you get scarring just as you do when you cut yourself and, and scarring leads to the deposit of, of a product or collagen. Uh, and that leads to stiffening and thickening of the, of the tissues. And you can see on the right-hand picture how much the, the scarring has decreased the available airway space. And the brown staining in this picture is the increased production of the receptor that we're targeting called CXCR4. In the bottom panel, you can see what we're trying to achieve with our drug AD214. The left image um, shows a normal mouse lung. In the middle, you can see a mouse lung where we've, where we've created fibrosis. Uh, and the purple staining here is collagen now, uh, rather than CXCR4. And the right-hand panel, you can see that when we treat with AD214, we get a much more normal tissue architecture retained or returned. So that's what we're trying to achieve overall. And now on the basis of this data, we've been able to move into human clinical trials. And the next slide shows us the preliminary results of single dose studies. So we've now generated data showing that we have an excellent profile from single doses of AD214. We've shown that we engage the CXCR4 receptor, which is obviously the important next step if we're gonna modulate, modulate disease. And importantly, we've shown that we can sustain high levels of receptor occupancy for extended periods of time. What this means is that we can block the receptor for long enough that we can extend dosing intervals to multiple weeks. Um, and so we've now moved this program into a multi-dose study, uh, and this will be the key before we can start moving into patients to study efficacy. If I turn now to our GE asset, our collaboration on immuno-oncology, um, the key here is that immuno-oncology drugs were a novel class of drugs that opened up cancer therapy by essentially reactivating a patient's own immune system to fight their cancer. The problem is that only a small percentage of patients actually respond to these drugs, one in four or one in five. Um, and so there's a great need to identify who those responders are early. And so GE came to us uh, looking for uh, an eye body against a biomarker of response to immuno-oncology drugs. Uh, that happens to be a molecule called Granzyme B. And the idea is that we use the eye body to deliver a radio labeled uh, tracer into the tumors. And if they light up uh, because there's Granzyme B being produced, um, then we know that the patient is responding. This means we can get patients onto the right treatment way, way faster. 
So the next slide shows the status of this collaboration, bearing in mind that this is a $6.4 billion imaging market. The leading products generate 400 million in sales. Um, GE have funded our discovery program. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced that they had selected a panel of eye bodies to move into preclinical development. So we're now uh, developing manufacturing processes and, and conducting studies in cells and in animals to prove that uh, the concept actually works. Uh, we've so far generated a million dollars in revenue from this program and will continue to generate revenue as we provide manufacturing support to GE through the preclinical phase. Um, eventually, we'll earn milestones and royalties from this asset uh, as the program uh, gets to market. The next slide outlines our overall business model. Um, it's all about our iBody platform, as we've discussed. And we use that in two ways. We use it to create a pipeline of internal assets such as AD214 that we develop through to phase one safety studies and then out license to major pharma. Uh, in addition to AD214, we expect to add two more targets into our pipeline in 2021. The second way we exploit the iBody platform is collaborations with external partners like GE. Um, and in this case, uh, we anticipate adding an additional collaboration in 2021. So you can see that we're well on the way now from being a single product company a couple of years ago to five products by the end of this year, which puts us on track for that 10 product pipeline by 2023. And the next slide. Um, so this shows us how to think about um, value at Adalta. Um, we are very much, uh, we think, uh, 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 an interesting investment opportunity right now. Um, the analysts that are covering us uh, are valuing AD214 alone at about $70 million, which is two to three times our current market cap. But in addition to that, we have the value of the external partnerships such as GE and the inherent value of the platform to create more and more assets. Uh, the next slide shows our upcoming milestones. We've got a busy next half of the year, particularly around AD214 as we take it through the remainder of phase one uh, clinical trials and open up that first partnering window. Uh, but also as we start to add the additional products into our pipeline. The next slide covers our uh, corporate um, vital statistics, if you like. Uh, Tim's already covered the uh, return to shareholders over the course of the last year. Uh, we had $6 million in the bank at the end of March, uh, which gets us through a significant part of the next um, uh, uh, set of milestones. And the final slide, uh, really just summarizes why we think uh, Dalta is a, is a great investment uh, for you to consider in your portfolios now. We've got a platform capable of creating value through multiple assets over time. We've got a lead asset with potentially multiple indications. It's a first in class asset and it's in the clinic. We have a second asset that's already partnered with a major multinational company and is generating revenue. Uh, we have a clear vision for how we repeat those processes to generate more drugs. We have a team in place who are all industry expertise uh, we are or in industry experts in their various disciplines. Uh, we're not uh, purely a group of, of founders uh, and we have a very robust near-term uh, catalyst and news flow coming. Uh, so with that, I'll hand back to Tim. Thanks, Tim. Um, quite a few questions here. So, so from a, so an investor gets an understanding of why you target a, a particular drug and disease like fibrosis, what, what's the thinking about why that's first? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the art for a company like ours with a, with a platform technology is where do you point it? You know, what are the targets you're gonna address? So we have a very disciplined approach uh, that I'd love to say we applied to the first one. It was a bit more serendipitous. Uh, it just fits the criteria really well. But we spend a big chunk of time looking at where are the eye bodies gonna be specifically advantaged? So we're looking for areas where we know there's a target implicated in disease. We're not a dis target discovery company. We'll leave that to academic researchers. Um, and then we want to know that you can't hit it with a traditional antibody or a small molecule. So we want to be able to develop the case that says people have tried with this in the past. We know the target works, but we haven't been able to drug it effectively. And when you put all of that together, you get a target that the, the eye body is particularly advantaged for. On top of that, for our internal pipeline, we're focused on fibrosis, in inflammation and oncology because they're the disease areas we've learned through the first product. And um, you, you're obviously targeting many drugs across your platform. Are there, there any similar companies that have been very successful with this sort of strategy? So the poster child for our sector actually is a company called Ablinx. Um, they were probably the first single domain antibody company. There are still only about a dozen of us out there, um, all with slightly different focuses. Um, Ablinx got their first product to the clinic in 2007. So they're about a 10, 12 years ahead of us. 
Uh, they were eventually acquired by Sanofi uh, 10 years later for 5 billion US dollars, which was a tenfold multiple on all the capital that had been raised along the way. Uh, and they'd progressively done about eight deals in that time frame with multinational pharma companies. Uh, and they had about 30 products in preclinical development and about uh, eight in clinical development uh, by the time Sanofi bought them. That's a significant price. Um, just a question here. Would uh, GE enter into a JV or is it just a question of licensing with them? Um, so in this case, effectively, it is a co-development arrangement. They brought us a target. They paid us to do the discovery work. Um, uh, and they're now doing most of the preclinical work, but it's a very much a collaboration while we work through the manufacturing um, of the eye bodies to support their uh, radiochemistry and, and preclinical. Um, technically, it's a co-development arrangement. Um, it's not a formal JV, but it's very much a collaboration as opposed to we do the work and then hand it over to them. And just one last question. Um, given the nature of your technology and the number of drug candidates you can produce, what is Ad Alter's view on the perfect time to license a drug? Um, look, at the moment, it's probably um, uh, once we've got clinical uh, safety data and ideally with an efficacy signal. Um, which is why we're developing a PET uh, imaging version of AD214 as well to go into a phase 1B protocol so we can get some more additional data other than safety to support licensing. Um, we'll contemplate it uh, anywhere from uh, preclinical proof of concept through to phase 2, but phase 1 really is the sweet spot for us.